Conservation is like holding a handful of sand. No matter how tightly you grip it, there are always grains slipping through between your fingers. It's hard to maintain a strong grip all the time. And if you don't top up the sand, eventually, over time, you will end up with nothing to protect. As a kid growing up here, I always assumed that Sudbury looked like the moon. I couldn't imagine a forest on these black rocks. I grew up in this environment, this black moonscape, desolate landscape. But as I got older, I began to realize that the truth was that just three or four generations earlier, Sudbury did not look like this. All of this area used to be huge red and white pine old growth forests. And you have to ask yourself, how can that happen? From such a rich natural environment to a moonscape, why weren't people demonstrating? Sudbury began as a logging town and quickly evolved into a mining town after the discovery of copper and nickel. Early methods of smelting in the form of roast yards were used to extract the metals at this time. These roast yards were made by stacking wood in piles as high as you and I, the size of five football fields, then covered with ore and set on fire. Burning for up to nine weeks, the sulfurous air would kill every bit of vegetation in its path, leaving behind a barren landscape that looked like the moon. All that vegetation couldn't grow back because whatever was left in the soil and dirt was full of heavy metals and acidity. Regreening began as an idea from a Laurentian University professor who wanted to see the red and white pine forest return to Sudbury the way it was for millennia. He came up with a method of spreading lime and dirt, which neutralized the pH levels and allowed the trees, red and white pine, birch and poplar to grow again. The regreening project here in Sudbury has been going on for 40 years and has changed the face of the landscape. And if you really want to know what Sudbury would have looked like three or four generations ago, that old growth red and white pine that used to be here, all one has to do is visit Wolf Lake, which is the largest remaining old growth red pine forest in all of North America. At one time, the old growth red and white pine forest stretched from the Maritimes all the way to the Great Lakes. Today, only 1.2% of that remains. And the largest part of that forest is here in the city of Greater Sudbury at a place called Wolf Lake. As far as what it's like to be in an old growth forest, it's really quite surreal. It's, it's, not, it's difficult to explain it to somebody at the dinner table. Oh, it's just so big and it's so beautiful and it's damp and the moss is so thick and it's effervescent looking. And you can say all those things. Um, but what you get standing at the base of an old growth tree is awe. And you can't, it's difficult to relate awe at the dinner table. You have to experience awe. You can't be shared awe or told about awe. You have to stand there and go, oh. comparison. I couldn't intellectually articulate a comparison of a 10-year-old a, a pine versus a 300-year-old pine. Um, it's, you know, I might as well uh, reverse that question around and say, well, tell me what the difference is between, you know, a 3-year-old and an 87-year-old man. Imagine that these 300-year-old pine trees are like our grandfathers and grandmothers, similar to our families, Old growth ecosystems require representations of all generations to be healthy and regenerate. The age of a tree can be determined by counting its rings, either by chopping the tree down, which is counterintuitive to our story, or you can take a core sample of the tree. In order to be considered old growth, red pine forests must feature trees at least 140 years or older. To 
250 years is very old for uh, Ontario trees uh, in northern Ontario because the fire cycle is somewhere around 70 to 80 years. That's that kind of period of time is when you'd expect to have a fire go through. And so these, a tree that's 250 years old or thereabouts has survived at least three fire cycles, possibly four. The red pine is resistant to fire. It has a thick bark and a ground fire will go through and wipe out lesser trees and other species. And yet the pine trees will survive that fire. We're standing here in the Tomogamy Forest in which uh, there's red and white pine. And, but red pine is less frequent than white pine. Perhaps 30% uh, of the Tomahawk Forest is of red pine and 70% is white pine, and that's tip more typical of Ontario. But in Wolf Lake you have this very large area, a very consistent, old-growth red pine almost entirely, which makes it perhaps the largest old-growth red pine stand in existence in the world. The ecosystem is rare. What old-growth does is it creates a unique structure uh, with dead standing snags and hollowed-out trees and a whole physical landscape that only emerges and only exists after hundreds of years of the forest persisting. Thousands of years of genetic heritage are embodied in these stands. Having survived under changing conditions, old growth trees may contain genes that will enable them to survive global climate change, new diseases, and future uncertainties. We have a record of um, the responses of those trees to a time when climate was different. And so that's the type of information we can get from older trees that you can get from younger trees. From younger trees that are maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years old, you, you won't have that longer record, which ecologists need to establish robust uh, relationships with climate. So they're, they're quite different and, and quite rare and, and quite frankly because they were very attractive uh, for lumber uh, in their day uh, and one well, still are. Uh, the, uh, they, many of the old growth pine forests were cut and eliminated. Why is it becoming rare? It shouldn't be rare. And throughout the great forest comes the lumberman's cry of timber! And there they go shot through the air like torpedoes to make the world's greatest stockpile of logs for war. Ships are loaded and push off on the Tribune paper mill at Thorold at the western end of Lake Ontario. It became rare because we did not harvest sustainably. We did not harvest in responsible ways. I'm not saying we didn't have to harvest. We needed to harvest. We're standing and sitting in, in, a, in a house made of wood and, and drywall and, and brick and things like that. We, definitely had to harvest, but we harvested in ways that were efficient for the truck driver, efficient for wherever the load had to go, so cut. In 1999, there was hope of things getting better. The Mike Harris government released Ontario's Living Legacy Land Use Strategy with the intention of setting aside 12% of the industrial forest to be protected for ecological integrity. Wolf Lake was clearly identified as one of those pieces that, that would be set aside and turned into a provincial park. But there was a conflict. There were mining leases and claims on the land that predated the living legacy, preventing Wolf Lake from becoming part of the larger park. Instead, Wolf Lake was given forest reserve status, preventing forestry, but allowing mining activity. The biggest problem is when you have a mining claim, and if you make it active, you have no restrictions with respect to removing trees. So you could just clear the whole thing because you want to, and uh, the timber would be gone. We'd like to secure it better into a uh, provincial park. The agreement was that as claims lapsed, they would become part of the surrounding Chiniguchi Waterway Park. Despite this, in 2012, the MNR proposed to downgrade the forest reserve status to general use area, making it sound more appealing for mineral investment. A group of local businesses and organizations banded together to oppose this legislation. 
When the coalition started out, uh, we were in a bit of a sprint and uh, the provincial government at the time was uh, proposing to uh, revoke the forest reserve status of the area. We mobilized very quickly a lot of people and, uh, and got that stopped, uh, but then our sprint very quickly turned into a marathon. While the coalition was fighting to protect the forest reserve status, the government allowed the Wolf Lake leases to be renewed for another 21 years. There's currently no legislation stopping them from making another renewal in the future. Who's going to remember to protect a forest in 2033? If it's still there, that is. Why didn't anybody demonstrate? Why didn't anybody raise a fuss about the destruction that had occurred here? Where are the old growth forests? And you know, over time, I came to realize that if change happens slow enough from one generation to the next, then no one generation recognizes the loss of the previous. Back in 1989, First Nation and environmental activists banded together to protect old growth just north of Wolf Lake. The district manager of Tomogamy gifted this road to the developers. Hundreds of people were arrested for blockading the Red Squirrel logging road in Tomogamy. Forcing the government to adopt a whole new look at how we deal or manage resources from a sustainable basis. The blockade resulted in several provincial parks and conservation reserves protecting old growth. Red Squirrel Road um, is a good example of and the power of the people, the power of uh, the voice of, of the First Nations, who were very actively involved in the blockades and just trying to tell people, well, this is our land, basically, and you're stealing from us yet again. You know, to the First Nations, everything was connected. Everything needed to be connected, and it's the same with building a road through a forest. Um, if you disconnect that continuity of that forest, um, you take away a great part of that that spiritual nature of it and the integrity of, of what's connected that we can't see. And a lot of that forest is connected um, under our feet. A place like Wolf Lake is highly valued and really important for the people of Wanapate First Nation. A lot of our learning is land-based and a lot of our place names are land-based. So, um, you know, if you would speak in Anishinaabemowin to describe a place, it would describe the place, not just like a, an arbitrary name, like, a, like I'm Stephanie, like that's my name, but it's not, it doesn't describe who I am. Whereas in our language, um, it's very descriptive and it, and it speaks to the land because that's, the connection was to that Part of the land you know so with losing places like that we're losing a part of our language a part of our identity and um, we're unable to carry that forward anymore because it's lost in my purism phase i used to think we need to create these places and no one should ever go in ever and uh i changed and i changed my mind I think that places like old growth forests should have trails through them. Those trails should come with rules. Once you have the rules in place and the trail systems in place and the access limited and guided professionally and properly, then no, I don't believe you'll love a place to death. I think people will go as they should go. But if there's no trails, no access, it's just locked off for, for beauty, well, okay, but then you better hope that every government's good with that. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is at some point, it's like, well, no one ever goes there. This place over here, we've been saving it for 38 years, and no one ever goes there. Yes, we get why we saved it in the first place, but hey, we have a strong argument for mining that valley. We landed on places like Wolf Lake that end up being called rare when they shouldn't have been. These trees stand as the last sentinels of old growth red pine ecosystems containing plants, animals, 
and human connections that exist in only these areas, which makes them vital, vital to protect, vital to top up their conservational sands. Don't be afraid to uh, climb trees. Get out there. Voice your opinions. Being arrested isn't so bad.